Today, we're people of the workaday world, up at early morning and hurry off to a waiting job, and most of us like it that way. Oh, we may grumble now and then about our work, but basically, we wouldn't have it any other way. We were brought up with the idea that work is clean and honest and good for you. But what about tomorrow, the day you retire, the day you no longer have that job to look forward to? What'll get you up for an eager start on the day then? I'm Jack Shelley from Iowa State University with a look at the second half, the second half of this amazing life we live. Let's just take a look to see where the second half begins. Sociologists and psychologists talk about the ages and stages of our life in this sort of pattern. We go from infancy through the preschool years, those years of rapid learning, middle childhood, which takes us up to about junior high age, adolescence, our high school days and phase, to young adulthood, and perhaps marriage, perhaps not, perhaps children, perhaps not. Then middle age, and the time when we could safely say that we're getting into the second half of our life. At around 55, we go through a decade of transition. And then we hit 65, the so-called age of retirement, and the first stage of the older age group, and then on to the second stage of older age. And so, unless you plan to live into the hundreds, and many of us might, you could say at age 40, you've got a pretty good toehold of the second half of your life. And what's going to happen to you in those next 40 years needs to be thought about now, when you're in your 40s, and not on the day you retire. When you leave an active job, what's left to hang on to? Just memories? What do others do? Oh, I think some of them take part-time jobs, and which is very fine, and uh, I haven't come to the place where I've had the time to do that yet. I do a lot of reading, awful lot of reading. You might do yard work, or handyman work around a house, or lots of things you could do. For one thing, I belong to Chamber of Commerce, and they have a coffee every week, and I go and enjoy it, and most of those people are not retired. Everybody should have a hobby. I don't care whether it's playing bridge, whether it's playing golf, whether it's some kind of artwork, a hobby shop to make grandfather's uh, plots and uh, uh, make fish lures and uh, most anything. I, I, I fixed all the way from teeth to glasses. People bring me and I'm very handy with my hands. And I've even put little screws in glass. My hobbies are bridge and reading. I love to read. I have made three Afghans since I retired three years ago, but I'm not very interested in hand work. If you like working with your hands, there are many avenues open to you, and they can be so absorbing that you can get lost with your skill practically tuning out the rest of the world. That way, you can enjoy every creative moment undisturbed. How do people get started with fascinating projects such as this? Well, four years ago this fall, I broke a bone in my foot, and I was grounded. <laughs> and I had to have something to do with my hands. And my husband bought me sculpture tools. I said, oh, I thought perhaps I'd be interested in that. He bought me sculpture tools for my birthday and got me some clay and I started in. Or the skill of rock cutting and shaping and polishing. Many are pursuing this interest today. Why? Your acquaintances make uh, a lot of the hobby for you. You become acquainted with somebody. Uh, we had an elderly lady that lived just across from us. She and her husband had been rock ha uh, hobbyists. And one day when we first moved in Clear Lake in town, uh, we, she and I were visiting in the backyard, and she said, uh, well, you folks should jo join the rock club. I said, well, where do they meet? And she, from there on, that was it.
These are so homely, they're actually sort of cute. They're Applehead dolls, another craft that's catching on for all ages. All it takes is an apple and a paring knife for peeling off that red or green exterior, and then for shaping the eyes, and next the nose, then you work on the mouth, and finally the ears. Then add some pipe cleaners so you can hang the apple head up to dry for a couple of weeks or so. Through the skillful hands of their creator, these apples become the elders from our past. When the apple dries, it shrinks. And even though I carve two exactly alike, when they're dry, they won't look alike. So after they're cured, then I decide if it'll be a man or a woman. And lots of times then, an old woman will still look like a man until she has her hair on, or maybe a hat. I don't always have too easy a time deciding what they should be doing. And I can't always tell until the person is made and sometimes dressed, and even then sometimes there'll be one that I just can't find an occupation for. Yes, there are many interesting things to do to make life more meaningful in your later years, too. But it does take an extra push from you to separate yourself from your work-oriented life. How do you do that? Psychologists found that some of us will go back to the same route that we followed as a child, learning to socialize all over again, especially if we've almost lost track of those around us by burying our total lives and our jobs. We need to learn once more how to interact with others. Our first step is learning to get along with ourselves once more. Psychologists call this a period of solitary socialization. We learn to take a good look inside and accept what we see. We need to do our own thing, do the things we want to do and say no to things we're not interested in. We need to enjoy ourselves, rediscover who we are and who we can become now that we're no longer tied to the demands of the world of work. Then there's a period of parallel socialization. That's a side-by-side -side sort of operation. Both parties may be working on similar projects, but each is working independently. However, you can feel the presence of the other person, and that's a comfortable feeling. And then there is the cooperative type of socialization. As far as adults are concerned, it's working together on a mutual project. It's cooperation with others, enjoying others with others. So let's see how, as adults, we might apply these three ideas. First, the solitary socialization, the being alone. After working with others for years, it may be a welcome relief just to spend some time with yourself, to rethink your values, to relax, to evaluate your skills, to consider new goals. But being alone may not be what you want 24 hours a day either. Usually, when you develop a genuine interest in something, sooner or later, you'll find someone else who has a similar interest, and then conversation takes on a new sparkle. And how about the side-by-side -side or parallel socialization? Say you're interested in old cars. Someone else is, too. Join them. You'll get a lot more out of it. A lot of time and a lot of fun, you know, plus a lot of friends and new, new people you meet, new associates, and a whole new interest. So we have a club that has, I think, 60 or 80 members, something like that. Take tours together and picnic and one thing or another. You can start at any age. Indeed, you can. Now, this may look like a side-by-side -side operation, each one doing his own thing. But it takes cooperation to make an old-time locomotive go. Here's a retired surveyor who joins younger men to keep this train on the go at the old Threshers reunion each fall, and all because of a boyhood interest in trains. Well, I was raised along the Rock Island, and I rode with their engine crews, I rode with Union Pacific engine crews, and I rode with Burlington engine crews, and that's the way I learned it, by observation. And what could be more cooperative socialization than quilting? 
Each woman contributes a bit of her talent and time to produce one massive array of art. Old and young alike get acquainted around this quilting frame. Here are three generations at work. How did each of them get started? Well, I suppose I took after my mother. She was a quilter in this same church. With my mother-in-law and my husband's aunt, we made some bed pads. Well, it was through my grandmother-in-law. I got interested. I saw one of the quilts they had done. This 90-year-old has an important place in the quilting party. She's still one of the chief pattern designers. She says it takes a lot of study to figure out a stitching design that looks good with the style of the quilt blocks. And giving some diversion to quilting is this once a week reader. The crowd swells when she comes. I have um, found books that I thought were, would be interesting to them. For instance, the pioneers that first came over from Norway and how they struggled to make both ends meet and even have little Norwegian phrases in there that I could, that would be interesting to them. So I've been lucky. Uh, they say they have enjoyed the books, and I know I have. Cooperative projects such as quilting can spur a lot of social good times as well. We asked the chairman about that. It gives a good thing for them to do is to come here and quilt. They have always something to look forward to. And this is when we have a lot of fun too, and there's a lot of laughter. And, and believe it or not, politics are one of the, the best topics we have. And there's always a little coffee party, too much food. But uh, yeah, they, it's a fellowship that's uh, so wonderful. Alone, side by side, or cooperative. These are the big three in socialization during our lifetime. But crafts and skills and hobbies are not the only avenues that offer these channels of enjoyment. Some people continue to find satisfaction in the world of work, perhaps a part-time job. Following the death of her husband, this woman found contentment in a dress shop. Here she found she could have contact with many people, from the junior miss right on through the older adult as well. And this is what many of us want, a chance to see and visit with the young as well as those of our own age. And on the job, we have many opportunities to meet and be with people of all ages. In fact, this may be one of the biggest things we miss the most after retirement, our contact with many different people. The world of work can offer opportunities to try new things too. For instance, this veterinarian gave up the small animal clinic he once had for a chance to manage his own pet shop. He still works in his own field, but with perhaps fewer outside demands. And with retirement a few years away yet, you may decide there's more to life than just the same old job day after day. As you look back at, say, age 40, you may decide that you too would like a change for the second half of your life. Enrolling in a class can stir up new interests. Here you can try something you've always wanted to learn. Just for fun, let it be something recreational, such as bridge. You don't have to get too serious about the game unless you really want to. Cards can be a relaxing pastime for both women and men. Sometimes there's four tables playing and sometimes there's only two and one. Cribbage is, is my game and they play a lot of pitch and other games, you know, but but my game is cribbage, but I can get in a game of cribbage, by, and I usually can why. Or join the ranks of those learning the finer points of chess. It can also be an avenue for finding out there are some pretty nice people in this world you hadn't even met before. Don't let the game get in your way of making friendships. The game itself lasts only a short time, but the friendships can last forever. And knowing a bit about chess, this game could last forever too. And while you're thinking about classes, don't forget, higher education is open to the past 40 crowd as well. We're seeing more and more people 
coming back to school. These are people in their 40s, their 50s, their 60s, even in their 70s. Some people come back for a bachelor's, some a master's, some a Ph.D. Some people just plain come back with no intention of finishing a college degree at all. We had one man who was 75 who came back just to take a course or two, became so involved with it that he decided that he might as well finish his master's degree while he was here. Or perhaps this is the time of your life when you finally feel you have time to volunteer to help with a worthy cause. It's also another way to meet others, such as in this RSVP program. We have volunteers go down to job registry on Monday and Thursday afternoon, and the older person looking for a job comes in and has an interview and finds uh, maybe a job that the person is interested in doing. These people, uh, over 60, the retired senior volunteers, they're anxious to do, to do any kind of a job assignment. I think their reward is their, their ma they're being made to feel useful and needed. There's always work to be done for others, but it's not the task itself that's as important as is the fellowship of other workers. This might be a side-by-side -side operation, or it could be a cooperative project. Whichever it is, conversation usually starts to flow, and before you know it, you're among people, enjoying people. Your church or synagogue is an important outlet for social contact with all ages, too. And as far as volunteering is concerned, the church welcomes your services. The choices here are many, and you do have a say in what you want to do. Now, if you just can't get the word work out of your system, then think about some worthwhile work around your community that needs to be done. One retired math professor did that, and he found that help with the young is always needed, and it's satisfying, too. I like kids. The kids are like anybody that likes them. It isn't a case of me liking the kids so much. I, I do like kids, though. I'm, and uh, I think more, uh, any one of these kids in here are, are very, very tickled when they see me coming. So you see, I raise children of my own. And, and by the way, our house has always been, as long as we had kids, and even yet, it is a rendezvous where they can come and feel at home. From tiny tots on up, children need your love and attention, and perhaps you need theirs. With more and more mothers on the job, more daycare centers and preschools could use such a helping hand. But can you, at retirement age, really get satisfaction out of working with children? Well, if I didn't, I wouldn't be here. If a thing is not fun to me, I'm not going to do it because I'm not going to torture myself. There's plenty of other good things I can do. So the things that I can do and that I enjoy and are fun, I do. And this retired factory worker spends time with kids too. Only his time is more in the form of entertainment. But children have a chance to stretch their minds a bit to figure out the magical acts he brings them. And even at age 79, this part-time magician knows what a thrill it is for children to see the impossible happen right before their very eyes. Uh, I entertain quite a few of the homes here in Dubuque, also schools and uh, convents, sisters' homes, and private homes. Some Once in a while they have a birthday party and they call on me for the entertain the children. And entertain them he does. He can abracadabra, wave that wand, poke things in, and pull things out until the children are bug-eyed with amazement as well as amusement. And don't think this magic maker doesn't get a big lift out of their reactions himself. It works both ways, you know. There are always older youth groups needing adult help, too. The 4-H program, scouts, and other youth organizations offer opportunities to associate with young people. 
to get to know them and become interested in their pleasures as well as their concerns. You can pass on some of the skills you've acquired over the years and maybe learn a few new ones too. Yes, volunteering is open to anyone at any age. Sharing your talents with youngsters as they grow can mean many pleasant hours for you and some memorable moments for them, too. Here's one father, for instance, who felt it was important to pass his talents along to his son. The father vied for top honors in old fiddler's contests for many years. When son Kirk was just eight years old, his dad bought him a pint-sized fiddle and started him out with the familiar old-time tunes. Even today, Kirk tunes back in on some of the rhythmic ways his father played. His dad died, but not without passing his talents on to relive in his son. You have something to pass on to today's youth, too. Your talents, your temperament, your tales, your encouragement. Yes, your heritage is their heritage, and it's something for our young people that they're seeking today. It's those of us in our second half of life who have that heritage to give them. Some communities in Iowa are putting a tremendous effort into keeping their past alive, with many of the elders pitching in. Here's an example of one of these communities, and their historic Norwegian museum plays a big role here. The director of that museum tells of their goal. We have classes primarily in the crafts because this really relates to our entire purpose. Uh, one of our purposes certainly in collecting and preserving the objects of the early immigrants uh, was to retain them as uh, inspiration for further, uh, for later generations. Uh, and uh, conducting the classes, of course, just speeds up the process, should we say, of uh, having these things uh, used as uh, inspiration. Rose modeling, of course, is one of the arts of their ancestors that they hope to preserve and one that they have classes in. We asked the director to describe rose modeling for us. It's a style of decorative double threads there and it's, it's a basic stitch that just goes over and over and over uh, the number of times that the pattern calls for. Hardunger is another type of stitchery from Norwegian ancestry. This one too, she says, is an even count type of embroidery. This is not stamped, and again you count threads from a pattern of some kind. And even patterns for finer drawn work are copied from museum archives. We have taken the design from something out of the museum. As a craft committee, we go in and look at the tapestries, the embroideries, the weaving, and if we find something that we think will adapt itself to this type of embroidery, we try to reproduce it just as authentic as we can in present day colors. Yes, there are so many interesting things to do and places to see. Deciding which may take the rest of your lifetime, but you're the one who gets to decide, and you don't have to be too serious about it either. Listen to the philosophy of this retired professor. He's ready to take off on more interesting ventures at the drop of a hat. I go out in the shop and I work when I want to. Now, uh, we have some shows to make when I get home. But if Grandma and I have to make up our minds that we want to go to Hawaii, we'll lock up the shop and go. This is not a business, it's a hobby. Or this retired farm couple who moved to a new location. We used to live here. We moved about nine years ago to Arkansas. We left uh, family, friends, and the whole, everybody up here. 
We go to craft shows there in Arkansas. We've gone as high as 150 miles out, and we used to go out and drive around different weeks and see what we could find. Yes, the world is full of interesting things to do and places to go and people to meet. And we need to be out discovering this while we're just beginning the second half of our lives, or sooner. It's the interests and talents that you develop today that you'll enjoy the most the rest of the days of your life. Start alone. Get to re-know yourself. You'll soon be rubbing shoulder to shoulder with others with similar interests. And perhaps your involvement will become much more interesting than you even imagined it could. So if you're looking ahead to a pleasurable retirement, start today by thinking ahead to those things you'll feel that you'll enjoy the most. <laughs>